This presentation will concern gospel principles and doctrines from 2 Corinthians chapter 8 through chapter 13. 2 Corinthians 8, true saints impart of their substance to the poor. 2 Corinthians 8 through 9, welfare efforts in the early church. One of Paul's ongoing efforts during his missions was to gather a collection for the poor in Jerusalem. Paul wrote about this collection in 2 Corinthians 8 through 9. In 2 Corinthians 8, verses 1 through 7, the churches of Macedonia had given generously to the cause, and Paul encouraged the saints in Corinth to do likewise. Paul later wrote that the Corinths had responded favorably to his request. Those who abound in faith and the attributes of, and the attributes of godliness are the ones who impart liberally of their substance for the temporal welfare of their brethren in the kingdom. That's an interesting connection, isn't it? Contributing of our substance to others liberally and our faith are kind of bound together. The more faith, the more liberal in our cause. The less faith, the less we will give of our substances. Paul explained in 2 Corinthians 8.12 that the willingness to give what one can is more important than being able to give in great abundance. In 2 Corinthians 8.14, Paul may have implied that the Corinthian saints enjoyed great temporal abundance, which they should have been willing to donate in gratitude for the generous spiritual supply they received from Jerusalem. When Paul spoke of equality among the saints, that's 2 Corinthians 8.14, he was not speaking of complete sameness, nor was he speaking of equality of outcome, but rather to equal, equal opportunity to satisfy all needs and wants. Latter-day Revelation clarifies that in matters of temporal welfare. Equality is determined in consideration of each person's needs, wants, and circumstances. That's in Dr. Covenants 51.3 and 82.17. The world today is caught up in the false philosophy and doctrine of equality of outcome. No, that was Satan's plan, remember? I will force them to all live the gospel and they will come back. Equality of outcome. That is Satan's plan. Those who propose it are under his direction. All that God promises us is the equality of opportunity. And then the rest is up to us. President Dieter, Dieter F. Uchtdorf of the First Presidency taught about the obligation that church members have to assist the poor. Quoting him, In the Lord's plan, our commitment to welfare principles should be at the very root of our faith and devotion to him. Since the beginning of time, our Heavenly Father has spoken with great clarity on this subject from the gentle plea, If thou lovest me, thou wilt remember the poor and consecrate of thy property to their support. That's Dr. Covenants 42, 29-30. To the direct command, remember in all things the poor and the needy, the sick and the afflicted, for he that doeth not these things, the same is not my disciple. DNC 5240. To the forceful warning, if any man shall take of the abundance which I have made, and not impart his portion according to the law of my gospel unto the poor and the needy, he shall with the wicked lift up his eyes in hell, being tormented. Doctrine and Covenants, section 104, verse 18. Continuing Elder Uchtdorf's quote, While it is important to have our thoughts inclined toward heaven, we miss the essence of our religion if our hands are not inclined towards our fellow men. Our spiritual progress is inseparably bound together with the temporal service we give to others. 
This very hour, there are many members of the church who are suffering. They are hungry, stretched financially, and struggling with all manner of physical, emotional, and spiritual distress. They pray with all the energy of their souls for succor, for relief. Please do not think that this is someone else's responsibility. It is mine and it is yours. We are all enlisted. In the Lord's plan, there is something everyone can contribute. End of his quote. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 8, saying, Paul is saying, I am not la laying commands upon you. I am only telling you what has been suggested by the liberality of others in order to give you the chance of proving your sincerity. 2 Corinthians 8 through 9, Paul is saying, We speak often of the riches of Christ, meaning the glories and rewards bestowed upon the faithful. Quote, Dr. and Covenant 6 through 7, Behold, he that hath eternal life is rich. Paul says that these riches grow out of and come because of our Lord's poverty. That is, though he was a god, though he had all power, though with his father he owned and ruled the universe, yet he forsook the wealth of eternity, became mortal, and by way of contrast dwelt in temporal po po poverty, that thereby he might perform the labors worm whereby many could gain eternal riches. 2 Corinthians 8, 10 through 15, verse 10. In saying this, I am not saying a command upon you, for you have already manifested the Spirit and practiced the duty of giving this 12-month past. Verse 11, complete the offering according to your means. Verse 12, for the willing mind is shown by gifts in accordance with your ability and not by foolish extravagance beyond it. Dr. Covenant 64, 34 says, Behold, the Lord requires the heart and a willing mind, and the willing and obedient shall eat the good of the land of Zion in the last days. That kind of sums up what Paul is trying to to tell the saints in Corinth, how is your heart and your mind? Is it willing to follow and submit to the will of God? Verse 13, my purpose is not to make others a burden upon you. Verse 14, but to get you to supply what they lack and them to supply what you lack. Verse 15, thus acting on the principle of equality illustrated in the bestowal of manna in bygone days, that none should have too much and none too little. 2 Corinthians 8, verses 16 through 24. Paul sent brethren to collect donations for the poor in Jerusalem. In 2 Corinthians 8, 16 through 24, Paul spoke to the Corinthian saints about the brethren who were being sent to collect charitable contributions for the saints in Jerusalem. He mentioned Titus, verses 16 and 17, and two other brethren, verses 18 and 22. While speaking of one of these brethren, Paul spoke of his confidence in the Corinthian saints. The Joseph Smith translation of 2 Corinthians 8, 22 through 23 clarifies this confidence. The bolded part in the quote is the added Joseph Smith translation. Quote, and we have sent with them our brother, whom we have proved diligent in many things, but now much more diligent. Therefore we send him unto you in consequence of the great confidence which we have in you that you will receive the things concerning you to the glory of Christ. 2 Corinthians 8.24 Proof of your love. Love is shown forth or proved by good works. How much do we love our brethren? Proportionally as we serve them. How much do we love the Lord? Proportionately as we keep his commandments. Didn't he say, if you love me, he answered, keep my commandments. 
John 14, 15. We are only fooling ourselves if we say we love the Lord, but we do not strive to keep his commandments to the best of our ability. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. God loves and rewards a cheerful giver. 2 Corinthians 9, verses 1 through 5. Verse 1. There is no need to write to you about the purpose and necessity of the collection. Verse 2, for your zeal in the matter is well known and has been used by me as stimulus to the Macedonians. Verse 3, I sent our friends to you only to make sure that our boast of you has not been vain. Verse 4, he bids them realize how much he would be ashamed before the Macedonian delegates if they were unprepared. At the same time, he suggests in passing that he is sure their own shame would, be not, would not be less than his. Verse 5, he desires their gift to be ready before he came, that it might be evident to the delegates that they had given it of their own free will and did not have to drag it out of them through shame in his presence. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 13. He which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Paul noted that those who sowed, donated to the needy, bountifully would also reap, receive bountifully from the Lord. On the other hand, he which soweth sparingly shall also shall reap also sparingly. 2 Corinthians 9, 6. Verse 7, give not grudgingly. What blessings flow to a grudging giver? An answer Moroni taught. God has said a man being evil cannot do that which is good. For if he offer a gift or prayeth unto God, except he shall do it with real intent, it profit him nothing. For behold, it is not accounted unto him for righteousness. For behold, if a man giveth, being evil, giveth a gift, he doeth it grudgingly. Wherefore, it is counted unto him the same as if he had retained the gift. Wherefore, he has counted evil before God. That's Mormon 7, 6 through 8. Or, I'm sorry, Moroni 7, 6 through 8. The reason that giving grudgingly profiteth nothing and is counted as if we had retained the gift is because doing the works of the laws of Christ grudgingly does not help us in becoming like the Savior. So it is, it is as if you had not done it, even though it may help the one receiving the help. Living the gospel is not just a list of things God requires us to perform, but are meant to help us become more like him. So that's why if I do something grudgingly, I am not becoming like Christ. Therefore, it's as if, in, in my, uh, pertaining to me, it would be as if I had never done it, even though it might be helpful to the person you are helping. Elder Dale Girenland of the Quorum of the Twelve said, Our Heavenly Father's goal in, in parenting is not to have his children do what is right. It is to have his children choose to do what is right and ultimately become like him. If he simply wanted us to be obedient, he would use immediate rewards of punishment to influence our behaviors. But God is not interested in his children just becoming trained and obedient pets who will not chew on his slippers in the celestial living room. No, God wants his children to grow up spiritually and join him in the family business, that of Godhood. That's why we have to become like him. It's not just doing the gospel. The doing has to lead to becoming. In 2 Corinthians 9, verse 9, Paul quoted Psalms 112, verse 9, referring to a good man who hath given to the poor. In verse 10, Paul referred to God's abundant blessings to those who give generously. 
In verses 12 through 13, Paul said that good things would result from the Corinthians' unselfish giving. The needs of the Jerusalem saints would be met, and those saints would in turn give generous thanks to God. In modern times, one way members of the church make donations for the poor is through fast offerings. President Marion G. Romney of the First Presidency taught about the blessings that accompany generous fast offering donations, quoting, I am a firm believer that you cannot give to the church and to the building up of the kingdom of God and be any poor financially. I remember when Brother Melvin J. Ballard laid his hands upon my head and set me apart to go on a mission. He said in that prayer of blessing that a person could not give a crust to the Lord without receiving, receiving a loaf in return. That's been my experience. If the members of the church would double their fast offering contributions, the spirituality in the church would double. We need not keep, we need to keep that in mind and be liberal in our contributions. End of quote. It's the same principle of tithing. I would not be able to live on 100% of my income. But when I pay tithing, I can live on 90% of my income because the Lord blesses and consecrates my efforts. 2 Corinthians 10, every thought into obedience. Bring every thought into obedience. The apostle beseeches the Corinthians to act in such a way that he will not need to resort to extreme measures on the occasion of his forthcoming visit. He points out that his purpose is to make every man's thoughts subject to the power of Christ and that he will punish any who are rebellious when the church as a whole shall have re turn to its obedience. He goes on to say that those who have been accused those who have been accusing him of cowardice will soon find themselves mistaken. He will make no boast that his record cannot justify, and he will boast chiefly of his successes in converting the Corinthians themselves. This was a field of labor the apostle had made particularly his own and he hoped for the assurance of the church in carrying the gospel further west. But let them not forget that the only glorying that was safe was that which came through seeking the approval of the Lord. It's kind of like Alma when he started to boast. And Ammon says, I, I fear your boasting unto God is sinful. As Alma says, no, I'm not boasting of myself, but I'm boasting in my God. 2 Corinthians 10, 1 through 2, the meekness and gentleness of Christ. The meek are the God-fearing and the righteous. The gentle are those who shun strife and contention, who teach the gospel in kindness and patience. As a prototype of all godly attributes, the Lord Jesus, after whom Paul patterned his own life, exemplified these characteristics in perfection. I am meek and lowly in heart, he said in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, is our Lord's own description of himself. Meekness is voluntary humility versus one becoming humble because of circumstances, which the Lord also exemplified. He humbled himself voluntarily. Paul invokes Christ's meekness to indicate the spirit in which he wishes to deal with his opponents. Verse 2, according to the flesh, that is, in a worldly spirit. His enemies declared that he was the one who sought his own advantage and tried to gain popularity by whatever method seemed best at the moment. When he was at a distance, he issued commands and declared his authority over the church. But when he came, they found him a poor creature who was overawed by the firmness of the church against him. 2 Corinthians 10, 3-6, For the weapons of our welfare are not carnal. In 2 Corinthians 10, 4, Paul taught that though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. 
In our spiritual war against Satan, we do not use carnal weapons, meaning the weapons used in worldly battles, but rather we use spiritual weapons. Paul taught that in this spiritual warfare, we must be careful of what and how we think. Verses 5 through 6. Elder Bruce A. McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught, quote, Though we are mortal, our weapons in the war with evil come from God who is immortal. By this power we overcome the world and refute that reasoning which does not lead to the true knowledge of God and his laws. Thoughts are the material from which belief is built, and to be saved, men must therefore Men must believe and therefore think the right things. We are therefore expected to govern our thoughts. Let thy thoughts be directed unto the Lord. Alma 37, 36. Let virtue garnish thy thoughts unceasingly. Doctrine and Covenants 121, 45. Our thoughts will also condemn us. Alma 12, 14. End of his quote. 2 Corinthians 10, 7-18, Paul defended his physical weaknesses. In 2 Corinthians 10, Paul defended himself against those who opposed him. Some of the criticisms leveled against Paul were personal in nature and related to his physical appearance and his speaking ability. See that in 2 Corinthians 10, 10. Such attacks on Paul's physical shortcomings demonstrate the weakness of his detractor's character. The scriptures contain many examples of the Lord using individual, individuals with perceived physical weaknesses to accomplish his work. For example, both Enoch and Moses struggled with physical challenges. The Lord stated that the weak things of the world shall come forth and break down the mighty and strong ones. Doctrine Covenants 119, and also 1 Corinthians 1, 25-27. Elder Marvin J. Ashton of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles spoke of the mistake of judging people by the wrong criteria. Quote, we also tend to eval evaluate others on the basis of physical outward appearance, their good looks, their social status, their family pedigree, their degrees, or their economic situations. When the Lord measures an individual, he does not take a tape measure around the person's head to determine his mental capacity, nor to his chest to determine his manliness, but he measures the heart as an indicator of the person's capacity and potential to bless others. Second Corinthians 7 through 10, verse 7. You are too much influenced by appearances. My opponents say, my opponents say that I do not act as an apostle of Christ, do they? But sure that I am just as devoted a servant of Christ as any who assert their superiority. Verse 8, even if I boasted of my authority which Christ has given me, I should still be justified. Verse 9, I write this to show that I am not seeking to terrify you by empty threats. Verse 10, for according to my opponents, my presence among you and my appeals were alike ineffective. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 8, 13 through 17 in chapters 11, verses 16 through 18, Paul use of the word boast. As Paul defended his position as an apostle, he acknowledged that it may have seemed to some like he was boasting of his authority. The word boast in 2 Corinthians 10, 8 means to glory or exalt. See 2 Corinthians 10, 13 through 17 and 11, 16 through 18. Paul's boasting when speaking of his missionary service should not be understood as being prideful. Instead, it may be seen as similar to Ammon's expression in the Book of Mormon. I know that I am nothing as to my strength, I am weak. Therefore, I will not boast of myself, but I will boast of my God. For in his strength I can do all things. 
Who can glory too much in the Lord? Yea, who can say too much of this great power and of his mercy and of his long suffering towards the children of men? Alma 26, 12 and 16. That's what I was referring to earlier, and I got Alma and Ammon mixed up. It was Ammon who was accused of boasting too much, not Alma. 2 Corinthians 10, 11 through 18. Verse 11, Paul warns his antagonists, Let such an one think this, that such as we are in word by letters, when we are absent, such will we be also in deed when we are present. When he arrives, he'll deal with them summarily and with authority. Verse 12, his confidence was not based on comparison with his opponents. Such a method of self-commendation is useless and foolish. Brothers and sisters, it is foolish to compare ourselves with others because we will always compare our worst attributes with someone's best attributes. And, and, and then we'll just become depressed. Do not compare yourselves to others. Only compare yourself to yourself and how you're doing in becoming like God. Verse 13, Others may boast without reason, but we will make no boast which cannot be justified by our work, a work which includes your conversion. Verse 14, For in claiming you as our converts, we are not making too great a boast. And we are not, verse 15, And we are not taking credit for other men's labors as our opponents are for ours, but are rather hoping that as your faith increases, so also will our influence. Verse 16, that we may be aided to preach the gospel in districts beyond your city and not seek, as some are doing, to claim credit for success where others have labored before us. Verse 17, the only safe rule about boasting of success is this, he that glorifieth, let him glory in the Lord. Verse 18, for self-praise is no asset attestation of the work that is done. That attestation is only shown when God's blessing attends and prospers it. 2 Corinthians 10, 10 through 13, verse 18, comparing themselves among themselves. Paul wrote that he might be physically weak compared to some other people. However, he pointed out that it is not wise for people to measure themselves through comparison to others, as I had just mentioned earlier. Rather, we should measure ourselves according to the rule or standard which God hath given to us. The prophet Joseph Smith encouraged church members to measure themselves through a comparison to God. Search your hearts and see if you are like God. I have searched mine, and I feel to repent of all my sins. End of Joseph Smith's quote. Sister Patricia T. Holland, former member of the Young Women's General Presidency and wife of Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, shared her personal insight about the importance of not comparing ourselves with others. My greatest misery comes when I feel I have to fit in what others are doing, or what I think others expect of me. I am most happy when I am comfortable being me and trying to do what my Father in Heaven and I expect to be. For many years, I tried to measure the oft-times quiet, reflective, thoughtful Pat Holland against the robust, bubbly, talkative, and energetic Jeff Holland and others with like qualities. I have learned through several fatiguing failures that you cannot have joy in being bubbly if you are not a bubbly person. It is a contradiction in terms. I have given up seeing myself as a flawed person because my energy level is lower than Jeff's and I don't talk as much as he does, nor as fast. Giving this up has freed me to embrace and rejoice in my own manner and personality in the measure of my creation. End of quote. What great doctrine. 
2 Corinthians 10, 12, and 18. Some that condemn themselves. Paul said of his detractors that they condemn themselves and are therefore not wise, 2 Corinthians 10, 12. Paul suggested that we should not praise ourselves, but should seek, instead seek the Lord's approval. President Didier, Didier F. Uchtdorf of the First Presidency taught about the pride that is related to self-commendation. Quote, at its core, pride is a sin of comparison. For though it is usually begins with, look how wonderful I am and what great things I have done, it always seems to end with, therefore, I am better than you. When our hearts are filled with pride, we commit a grave sin. For we violate the two great commandments. Instead of worshiping God and loving our neighbor, we reveal the real object of our worship and love, the image we see in the mirror. Pride is the great sin of self-elevation. This sin has many faces. It leads some to reveal in their own perceived self-worth, accomplishments, talents, wealth, or position. They count these blessings as evidence of being chosen, superior, or more righteous than others. This is the sin of, thank God, I am more special than you. At its core is the desire to be admired or envied. It is the sin of self-glorification. End of quote. 2 Corinthians 11, maintaining the simplicity that is in Christ. Paul says that he also will now boast a little, for he is as much an apostle as those whom they prefer. If he refuses monetary support from them, it is in order to prevent these false teachers charging him with making gain of the ministry. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 1 through 3. Verse 1, bear with me a little if I begin to boast foolishly. Yes, do bear with me. Two, verse 2, my affection for you makes me apprehensive, even as I may say that God also is apprehensive regarding you. For I have, as it were, betrothed you to Christ and cannot endure that you should be unfaithful to your beliefs. Indeed, the Lord's church is married to her bridegroom. The disciples of Christ take upon themselves the name of Christ. Verse 3, I fear lest these false teachers corrupt your minds, even as Satan with his smooth tongue corrupted even so that your mind would be corrupted from the simplicity in Christ. Verse 3, the simplicity in Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ is plain, pure, simple, easy to be understood. It is not some hidden mystery beyond man's comprehension. Its doctrines are clear to the understanding. Its ordinances are easy to identify. Its symbolisms are not buried in obscurity. Its God stands revealed and is known to the true worshipers. Mystery, complexity, and incomprehensibility, and unknowable God, these and all such like are born of apostasy. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 4 through 6. Verse 4, And my fear is not without reason, for you are certainly very favorably inclined towards those who, being quite a, who bring quite a different gospel from that which I preached. From Paul's day to this, hosts of would-be ministers have and do preach as a Jesus of every sort and fashion. Verse 5, But if you tolerate them, you can surely tolerate me. For I venture to think that I am quite as good in every way as these eminent apostles of yours. Verse 6, I may know little of the art of speaking, as they say, but at least I know something of the divine truth as abundantly clear from my work among you. 2 Corinthians 11, uh, verses 7 through 9. Verse 7, it is a fault in your eyes that I took nothing from you while laboring for your spiritual benefit, but gave you the gospel gratuitously. Verse 8, I took more than their due from others to promote my mission to you. Verse 9, and anything I wanted when among you, I received not from any of you, 
but from the brethren who came from Macedonia. Hitherto I have been independent of your gifts, and so I intend to remain. He did, and did not want his own temporal needs to be burdensome to the church. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 10 through 15. Verse 15, I assure you by the truth of Christ within me that I shall permit not one to interfere with the grounds of this boast in the district of Achaia. Verse 11, and that too, not because I despise you and contemn your gifts, verse 12, but because I am determined that my opponents shall have no occasion to charge me with selfishness, but that they may show themselves as disinterested as I am. Verse 13, for they are really hypocrites and deceivers, pretending to be apostles of Christ. Verse 14, their master Satan is accustomed to masquerade as an angel to further his base designs. Verse 15, we cannot wonder, therefore, if his servants pretend to be servants of God, but their punishment shall be suited to their actions. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 1 through 5, and verses 13 through 15, warnings against false apostles. In 2 Corinthians 11 through 12, Paul issues a warning about false teachers among the Corinthian saints, who were not the righteous ministers they appeared to be. He used strong terms as he compared them to the serpent who beguiled Eve through his subtlety. Paul reasoned that just as Satan himself can appear as an angel of light, the false apostles in Corinth had a, the appearance of ministers of righteousness. 2 Corinthians 11, 13, and 15. These individuals preached another Christ. Although it is unclear what specific doctrines these false apostles were teaching about Jesus Christ, we know that on another occasion, Paul had to refute claims in Corinth that Christ had not risen from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, 13 through 19. He had to show the Corinthians that Christ was resurrected, even though they were claiming he hadn't been. In contrast to the false apostles in Corinth, Paul testified that he was an authentic apostle who was in no way inferior to the very chiefest apostles. In 2 Corinthians 12.12, 12, Paul invited the Corinthian members to consider if his works among them were signs of a true apostle that authenticated his ministry. Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve describes some differences between true and false apostles in our day, quoting, In the general sense, a true apostle is an especial witness of the Lord's name, one who knows by revelation that Jesus is the Lord. A false apostle is one who pretends to be a teacher and witness of true doctrine without having the requisite personal revelation. In the specific sense, a true apostle is one who has been ordained to that office in the Melchizedek priesthood and who normally serves as a member of the Council of the Twelve, and who therefore has power and authority to govern the church. A false apostle is one who professes to have power to govern the affairs of the church on earth, but does not, in fact, have the requisite endowment of divine authority. End of quote. Paul thought, taught that those who compared themselves among themselves are not wise and should instead seek the Lord's commendation. 2 Corinthians 11, 15, Satan's ministers. Who are they and how they be known? Joseph Smith have given, has given us his answer. Quoting Joseph, if any person should ask me if I were a prophet, I would not deny it, as that would give me the lie. For according to John, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Therefore, if I profess to be a witness or teacher and have not the spirit of prophecy, which is the testimony of Jesus, I must be a false witness. But if I be a true teacher and witness, I must possess the spirit of prophecy." And that constitutes a prophet. And any man who says he is a teacher or a preacher of righteousness and denies the spirit of prophecy is a liar. And the truth is not in him. And by this key, false teachers and impostors may be detected. 
2 Corinthians 11, verses 16 to 23. Verse 16, again I say, do not think me a fool. Or if you do think me a fool, let me indulge like your other apostles in a foolish boasting. Verse 17, I am not speaking now under the inspiration of Christ. I am only answering fools according to their folly. Verse 18, since many other teachers are boasting of their qualifications, I shall boast of mine in his conquest for Christ. On righteous glorifying, see in Alma 26, we talked about. Verse 19, for you who are so wise yourselves have a great, have a great appreciation for fools. Verse 20, you are very patient with people who delude and cheat you and who insult and injure you. Verse 21, I confess to my shame, I was far too weak, as they call it, to act in that way. But if there is to be boasting, I am a fool and can boast too. Verse 22, are they of the chosen race claiming Abraham as their ancestor? I am on equal footing with them. Verse 23, do they boast of their missionary service? I am ready to compare my service with theirs, and the comparison will not be in their favor, though, of course, all such boasting is madness. I have been in far more trials and punishment and dangers than they. Why should he hesitate to recount his scourgings, stonings, and shipwrecks suffered while on the Lord's errand? Why not glory in overcoming perils, weariness, pain, coldness, and nakedness? Truly, the suffering of the faithful are swallowed up in the glory of Christ's service. See Doctrine and Covenants 8480. You can tell in Corinth that we're really having a hard time with Paul being a true apostle by accusing him of false things and seeing some of his weaknesses that we all have as that showing proof that he's not an apostle and that claiming these other false Apostles were the true ones. Second Corinthians eleven twenty three through thirty three, Paul's trials are evidence of his commitment to declare the truth of Christ. In Second Corinthians eleven verses twenty two through thirty three, Paul listed many of the sufferings he passed through as he ministered as a loyal disciple of Jesus Christ. Paul's ministry covered three decades, during which time he traveled well over 10,000 miles, or 16,093 kilometers, much of it on foot. As a disciple of Jesus Christ, Paul willingly endured a remarkable number of hardships, many of which are recorded in Acts. The five beatings of 40 stripes save one, see 2 Corinthians 11, 24 to 28, that Paul received from Jewish authorities were the severest form of whipping Paul could have received under Jewish law. Despite the repeated beatings, Paul continued to serve, I'm sorry, to visit synagogues to proclaim the gospel to his fellow Jews as well as to Gentiles. The combination of these trials is staggering to contemplate. Without apostolic authority and a deep commitment to Jesus Christ, it is unlikely that Paul could have endured such extreme difficulties. In contrast to those whom Paul labeled as false apostles, Paul had proper authority, and his ministry was evidence of his sincere, devoted discipleship. 2 Corinthians 12, Paul cut up into the third heaven. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 1, visions. Through supernatural means, by the power of the Holy Ghost, devout persons are permitted to have visions and to see within the veil. They are enabled to see spiritual personages and to view scenes hidden from ordinary sight. These visions are gifts of the Spirit. See the seventh article of faith. They come by faith and vanish away when faith dies out. Thus they stand as an evidence of the divinity of the Lord's work in any age. If the Lord is giving visions and revelations to a people, such a group constitutes the people of God. If vision and revelations are not being recorded by any church or people, then that group is not the Lord's people. By this test, the identity of the true church is known. See Moroni 7, 30-38. 
or Mormon 7, 30 through 38. Vision serves the Lord's purposes of preparing men for salvation. By them knowledge is revealed, 2 Nephi 4.23. Conversions are made, Alma 19.16. The gospel message is spread abroad. The church organization is perfected, Doctrine and Covenants 107.93. And righteousness is increased in the hearts of men. And visions are to increase and abound in the last days. For the Lord has poured out promised to pour out his spirit upon all flesh so that old men shall dream dreams and young men shall see visions. See Joel chapter 2, 28 through 32. 2 Corinthians 12, 2 through 4. Who was the man caught up to the third heaven? Employing a common rhetorical device of his day, Paul was referring to himself in the third person when he spoke of a man who was once caught up to the third heaven, 2 Corinthians 12, 2-4, which is the celestial kingdom. The prophet Joseph Smith received revelations giving further understanding of a third heaven. See Doctrine and Covenants 76, 50-112 and section 88, verses 22-31. And he explained, quote, Paul ascended into th the third heavens and he could understand the three principal rounds of Jacob's ladder, the telestial, the terrestrial, and celestial glories or kingdoms where Paul saw and heard things which were not lawful for him to utter. I could explain a hundredfold more than I ever have of the glories of the kingdoms manifested to me in the vision where I permitted and were the people prepared to receive them. Can you imagine, brothers and sisters, if we would just prepare ourselves? Section 76, for how long it is, Paul, or Joseph Smith said, I can reveal to you a hundred times more of what I saw that is recorded in section 76 of the celestial kingdom and the different glories and different kingdoms. After recording that portion of their vision of the three degrees of glory which the Lord wanted published to the world, Joseph Smith and Sidney Ridgen added these inspired words, quote, But great and marvelous are the works of the Lord and the mysteries of his kingdom which he showed unto us, which surpasses all understanding in glory and in might and in dominion, which he commanded us we should not write while we were yet in the spirit and are not lawful, to utter, or lawful for man to utter. Neither is man capable to make them known, for they are only to be seen and understood by the power of the Spirit, which God bestows on those who love him and purify themselves before him, to whom he grants this privilege of seeing and knowing for themselves, that through the power and manifestation of the Spirit, while in the flesh, they may be able to bear his presence in the world of glory, and to God and the Lamb be glory and honor and dominion forever and ever. Doctrine and Covenants 76, 114 through 119. There are certain things, brother, we will only learn by being overcome by the Holy Ghost and seeing it while in the Spirit. By Paul sharing his experiences, one that neither his tractors nor the false apostles in Corinth could match, Paul reinforced his authority as an apostle of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 12.4, not lawful for man to utter. Just as Paul heard unspeakable words there that were not lawful for man to utter when he was caught up to the third heaven, we too may have spiritual experiences that we should share only when directed to do so by the Spirit. Please catch what President Boyd K. Packer of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles is now going to teach. Quote, I have come to believe that it is not wise to continually talk of unusual spiritual experiences. They are to be guarded with care and shared only when the Spirit itself prompts you to use them to the blessing of others. I am ever mindful of Alma's words. It is given unto many to know the mysteries of God. 
Nevertheless, they are laid up under a strict command that they shall not impart only according to the portion of his word, which he doth grant unto the children of men, according to the heed and diligence which he give unto them. Amma 12.9 Continuing Pres President um, <clears throat> Packer I heard President Marion G. Romney once counsel, I do not tell all I know. I have never told my wife all I know, for I have found out that if I talk too lightly of sacred things, thereafter the Lord would not trust me. We are, I believe, to keep all these things and ponder them in our hearts, as Luke said Mary did of the supernal events that surrounded the birth of Jesus. See Luke 2.19. Brothers and sisters, I fear too many times people share spiritual experiences in their life so that they may be looked upon as being spiritual. And see, look how spiritual I am. Look how good I am. Look what happened to me. I must be special. And that's why they share it for self-aggrandizement. You do that and God will quickly, immediately stop giving you revelation. 2 Corinthians 12, 5 through 6, verse 6, or <clears throat> I'm sorry, it should probably be verse 5. I can boast of these experiences, for they were due to no labor or merit of my own, but I will not boast of anything I have done myself, though I may speak of my weaknesses through which God's grace toward me has been manifested. Verse 6, for even if I wanted to boast of all the privileges I have received, I should be justified, for my words would be true. But I am unwilling that anyone should be led to think of me more highly than my service warrant. 2 Corinthians 12, 7-9, A Thorn in the Flesh The Greek word translated as thorn in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 originally referred to anything pointed, such as a sharpened stake, a surgical instrument, or a fishhook. By Paul's day, it came to be denoted a thorn or a splinter that causes significant irritation. The term a thorn in the flesh is a metaphor suggesting an infirmity that was troublesome to Paul. Many commentators have speculated on what Paul's infirmity might have been, proposing that perhaps it was epilepsy, a serious visual impairment, see Galatians 4, 13-15, or malaria. It appears that one of the positive results of this affliction was that it helped Paul avoid becoming proud. Weakness can lead to humble reliance upon the Lord. See Jacob 4, 7, Ether 12, 27, 37. Thorns measuring about 2 inches or 5 centimeters on the branches of a tree in Israel. So that's probably the kind of thorns he is referring to. Elder Richard G. Scott of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles commented on what we might learn from these teachings of Paul. Quote, Recognize that some challenges in life will not be resolved here on earth. Paul pleaded thrice, pled thrice, that a thorn in the flesh be removed. The Lord simply answered, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. 2 Corinthians 12, 7-9 he gave Paul strength to compensate so he could live a most meaningful life. He wants you to learn how to be cured when that is his will and how to obtain strength to live with your challenges when he intends it to be an instrument for growth. In either case, the Redeemer will support you. End of quote by Elder Scott. Elder Neil A. Maxwell said, quote, After finding and accepting God and putting things in proper perspective, we should then also understand that within the larger plan of salvation, which is commonality in certain of our challenges, there are also complementary individual plans for all of us, and each is enfolded into God's overall plan. Therefore, let us believe and trust in God enough that he can see us through our common challenges and on to the finish of our plans. If we will but humbly trust him and have faith in him, then his grace will be sufficient for us. End of quote. 
another quote by Elder Maxwell, Paul indicated that, quote, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Use of the word given suggests that Paul knew where from this affliction came. Further, as it must be with anyone who seeks sainthood, Paul had to be willing to submit to all things which the Lord seeth to inflict upon him. End of quote. Weaknesses cause men to rely upon the Lord and to seek his grace and goodness. If all men excelled in all things, would any develop the humility and submissiveness essential to salvation? As shown by Paul's life, even the greatest prophets, for their own benefit in schooling, though strong in the spirit, are weak in other things. Some have physical infirmities, others are denied financial ability, or, uh, or are lacking in some desirable personality trait. At least any think themselves more highly than they ought. 2 Corinthians 12, 7, Messenger of Satan. Whence comes diseases and infirmities from Satan or some other source? Without any question, sickness, distress, and physical incapacity arises because of the laws which God has ordained. Obedience to the laws of health bring health. Obedience to the laws opens the door. Disobedience to these laws opens the doors to disease and deformity. This principle is implicit in the very fact that deity has given us such revelations as the word of wisdom. If it were otherwise, Satan would smite apostles and prophets and the good and great in general with disease and affliction so that universal anarchy, disability, and plagues would reign over all the earth. Disease, infirmities, and afflictions are a part of this mortal experience. As a fallen person subjected to mortal conditions, having weaknesses to humble us if we will let them. 2 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10, healings are subject to the will of God. One lesson we can learn from Paul's repeated petition that the Lord remove his thorn in the flesh is that faith is not the only requirement for healing to take place. President Dallin H. Oaks of the First Presidency explained, quote, Although the Savior could heal all whom he would heal, this is not true of those who hold his priesthood authority. Most mortal exercises of that authority are limited by the will of him whom, whose priesthood it is. Consequently, we are told that some whom the elders bless are not healed because they are appointed unto death. D.N.C. 42.48 Similarly, when the Apostle Paul sought to be healed from the thorn in the flesh that buffeted him, the Lord declined to heal him. End of quote. 2 Corinthians 12, 8-10, Taking Pleasure in Infirmities As he spoke about his physical weaknesses, or thorn in the flesh, Paul stated that he could take pleasure in infirmities because his reliance upon the Lord allowed the power of Christ to rest upon him. Elder Robert D. Hells of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained some of the blessings he received while experiencing an extended period of poor health. Quote, In the past two years I have waited upon the Lord for mortal lessons to be taught me through the periods of physical pain, mental anguish, and pondering. I learned that constant, intense pain is a great consecrating purifier that humbles us and draws us closer to God's Spirit. Well, no wonder God puts us through those sometimes. We need to have that. Now back to his quote. If we listen and obey, we will be guided by his Spirit and do his will in our daily endeavors. There were times when I have asked a few direct questions in my prayers, such as, what, what lesson dost thou want me to learn from these experiences? As I studied the scriptures during this critical period of my life, the, the veil was thin and answers were given to me as they were recorded in the lives of others who had gone through even more severe trials. My son, peace be unto thy soul, thy adversary in thy afflictions shall be but a small moment. And then if thou endure well, God shall exalt thee on high. He was quoting DNC 121, 7 through 8. 
Dark moments of depression were quickly dispelled by the light of the gospel as the Spirit brought peace and comfort with assurance that all would be well. On a few occasions, I told the Lord that I had surely learned the lesson to be taught and that it wouldn't be necessary for me to endure any more suffering. Such entreating seemed to be of no avail, for it was made clear to me that this purifying process of testing was to be endured in the Lord's time and in the Lord's own way. It is one thing to teach, thy will be done. It is another to live it. I also learned that I would not be left alone to meet these trials and tribulations, but that guardian angels would attend me. The experience of the last two years made me stronger in spirit and given me courage. I'm sorry, the experiences of the last two years have made me stronger in spirit and have given me courage to testify more bold, boldly to the world the deep feelings of my heart. End of his quote. Verse 19 in 2 Corinthians 12. Do you think that all I have been writing is a defense of my conduct to satisfy you? It is not you but God who will judge me. What I have written is for the purpose of helping you to strengthen character and raise the standard of Christian life as inspired by Christ's Spirit through living in union with Him. Verse 20, I am afraid, lest when I visit you, I find you unrepentant and obstinate, and I have to use severity. I am afraid, lest the dark passion and vices I reprove still disfigure the church. Verse 21, and least, least I be distressed and humiliated by the impenitence and shame, lessness of those who were given to sensual sins and still continue their evil habits. Second Corinthians chapter 13, examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Second Corinthians chapter 13, 1 through 4, verse 1. This is the third visit I am about to pay to you on this occasion. I shall proceed to punish these gross sinners after hearing all the evidence. Verse 2, I repeat now what I said on my second visit, that those who persist in sin and find me stern in punishment. 3, and why am I thus severe? Because you demand proof that I possess Christ's authority, though that proof should be found in your own experience. Verse 4, Christ indeed, as a helpless man, submitted to the death of the cross. He was able to die because Mary was his mother, and from her he inherited the power of mortality. But in the power of God, he still lives because God was his father, and from him he inherited the power of immortality. And in the same way, in the spirit of Christ, we have shown a forbearance which you mistook for weakness. But in the power of God, we shall exhibit our strength when we come. 2 Corinthians 13.5 Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. President Dallin H. Oaks taught, quote, Jesus issued the challenge, What think ye of Christ? The Apostle Paul challenged the Corinthians to examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. All of us should answer these challenges for ourselves. Whether it is our... <clears throat> Where is our ultimate loyalty? Are we like the Christians in Elder Maxwell's memorable des description who have moved their residence to Zion but still try to keep a second resident in Babylon? Boy, that's, that's a great imagery. There are many who try to keep one foot in Zion and one foot in the world and think they can straddle the fence. They will come to find out how untrue that is. Continuing Elder Oaks' quote, There is no middle ground. We are followers of Jesus Christ. Our citizenship is in his church, his gospel, and we should not use a visa to visit Babylon or act like one of its citizens. We should honor his name, keep his commandments, and seek not the things of the world, but seek first to build up the kingdom of God and to establish his righteousness. End of quote. 2 Corinthians 13, verses 6 through 14. Verse 6, Paul reminds those at Corinth that he is not a reprobate, that is, a disobedient, depraved, and unprincipled person 
who have departed from the faith and are thereby rejected of God. Verse 7, we pray to God that you may lead a pure and holy life, not to do us credit, but because it is right, even though we be like false apostles. That is, as if we had no authority, because we shall not he because we shall not need to show it. Verse 8, for our authority is given to us, given us to advance what is right and not to hinder it. In the eternal sense, nothing we do to fight the truth shall prosper. However possible and popular error may be, eventually it shall die. Truth only shall prevail. Verse 9, we rejoice when we have no need to reprove you. For then your Christian life is healthy, and this is what we most earnestly wish, that you become more press, become more perfect in all Christian graces. Verse 10, it is, it is, believe me for this reason, that I have written to you these earnest pressing concerns, because I do not wish to visit you in anger and severity. I have no desire to use the authority that Christ has given me in degrading and punishing you. For its true purpose is to strengthen my hands in helping you to become increasingly pure and holy in the spirit and character. Verse 11, be perfect, meaning seek to become a whole and complete in the gospel and lead pure lives. Verse 12, Joseph Smith's translation of 2 Corinthians 13, 12 replaces the word kiss with salutation. See footnote A of verse 12. A holy salutation is a special sacred salutation of greeting are reserved for those who belong to the family of Jesus Christ, who have taken upon themselves his name and who are worthy to enter his holy temples. Such are made in the name of the Lord with uplifted hands unto the Most High and are to this effect, quote, quoting Dr. Collins 88, 119, through 130 and 133 through 136, I salute you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in token or remembrance of the everlasting covenant, in which covenant I receive you to fellowship, in a determination that is fixed, immovable, and unchangeable, to be your friend and brother through the grace of God in the bonds of love, to walk in all commandments of God blameless, in thanksgiving forever and forever. Amen. Persons unworthy of this sacred greeting have no place in the house of the Lord. Verse 13, he sends greetings from their Corinthian brethren and verse 14 and invokes the blessings of God upon them. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this presentation, hit the like button and consider subscribing to my channel.